This video will introduce the basic BJT breakdown and temperature effects. It won't be a detailed study. It'll just make you aware of major effects so that you can go ahead and design BJT circuits. Here's a cartoon of a PNP BJT in active mode. Just a reminder that the forward voltage applied across the emitter base junction induces a large forward current flowing through it and that a reverse bias voltage applied across the collector base junction ensures that most of the emitter current is collected by the collector. And current flows in this direction for the PNP transistor shown here. Now imagine increasing the reverse bias voltage applied between base and collector. As you do so, the width of this depletion region will increase. The electric field intensity will increase. And we know that any PN junction with a sufficient reverse bias voltage applied will start to conduct current in the reverse direction. And it's called breakdown of the PN junction. And that can occur in the BJT for the collector base junction. So breakdown of the collector base junction occurs when the reverse bias voltage applied between base and collector exceeds a certain threshold. The polarity of the reverse bias voltage, of course, depends on whether you're talking about a PNP or an NPN transistor. But in either case, significant reverse current starts flowing and the collector current um, increases. To illustrate breakdown of the collector base junction, you can imagine a thought experiment such as the one shown here for an NPN transistor, where the emitter is biased with a constant current source, i.e. shown here, that we can set to whatever value we like. And then for any fixed value of i.e., we go ahead and sweep the collector base voltage by ramping this voltage source up and observe the resulting current IC. And what you end up with is the family of plots shown here on the right, where for each, each plot, is taken at a fixed value of emitter current and is the a plot of the collector current as we vary the collector base voltage. So first you can imagine performing such an experiment for IE set to zero. That's the same as basically connecting an open circuit in the emitter. So with that constant current of zero set in the emitter, there's no current flowing um, from the emitter and therefore no current flowing into the collector for a wide range of voltages. Now, in fact, there is a reverse bias applied across the collector base junction. And as we know, a finite leakage current does flow through any reverse bias PN junction, but it's a very, very small value until the collector base voltage reaches the breakdown voltage of that PN junction between collector and base. Then we get breakdown of that PN junction and the collector current starts increasing. Reverse current starts flowing through this PN junction, and it must flow out the base because we've connected an ideal current source at the value of zero in the emitter. So that's just simply breakdown of the collector base junction with no forward bias on the base emitter junction. Now, of course, the cartoon plot is shown here with a very sharp corner. In real life, the corner might not be so sharp, but certainly the current would increase rapidly once we reach the breakdown of that junction. Next, instead consider the case where we set the emitter current to some different value, i.e. 1. Now in this case, the base emitter junction must be forward biased so that it can be conducting a constant current, i.e. 1. And as long as we're in active mode, we expect IC to equal alpha, i.e. 1. So that's what we see here. And uh, we, the collector current remains around this value of alpha I E1 for a wide range of collector voltages all through this active region. Um, now, if the collector voltage drops low enough, we know that we enter saturation region specifically. Remember that we have to maintain at least 0.3 volts here. Stay in active mode. So um, that will fail to be the case once this collector base voltage drops to negative 0.4. Then the collector base junction becomes forward biased and we go into saturation. 
but that's not what we're focused on here. We want to talk here about breakdown of the collector base voltage, and that will occur for very large values of VCB, approaching the breakdown voltage of the collector base junction. Now, again, we won't go into detail about the physical uh, operations at play here, but it turns out that when there's a forward current flowing through the BJT, breakdown of the collector base junction arises at voltages slightly below the breakdown voltage of the PN junction on its own. And when that occurs, we start to see the collector current increase rapidly. Again, there'll be an extra current flowing uh, into the collector in addition to alpha times IE1, we'll get this extra reverse current flowing and um, it's gonna have to uh, come out the base because there's nowhere else for it to go with the constant current source connected in the emitter, this experiment. Now, um, that will occur at slightly different voltages for different settings of the emitter current, but it always occurs right around this breakdown voltage. So the breakdown voltage may be specified on the data sheet and um, it's sort of an upper limit, an absolutely upper limit on the collector base voltage that can be applied safely. A slightly different breakdown mechanism arises if we bias the base with a constant current IB and simply ramp up the collector emitter voltage. In this plot of collector current versus collector emitter voltage for constant bias currents, you may recall that we're in active mode so long as the collector emitter voltage is greater than about 0.3 volts. So all this region on the right here is active region. We see a relatively constant collector current except for the early effect, um, as we would expect. Um, now, at some voltage VCE, eventually, we will get breakdown of the transistor. The physical effects at play here are quite complex, but it turns out with the constant base current flowing, obviously the additional collector current that arises when we get to breakdown can't flow out the base. Instead, it has to flow down out the emitter. So um, it's a different breakdown mechanism that arises, and it occurs at voltages lower than the collector base junction breakdown voltage, often around half that voltage. So this collector emitter breakdown mechanism is in many cases more significant arises at lower voltages. Um, and what you see for constant bias current, let's say bias current IB1, it's constant. Once the collector emitter voltage gets to this breakdown voltage, the collector current starts increasing more rapidly than we expect simply from the early effect. And again, the precise voltage where this increase occurs depends on the bias point of the BJT. Since the breakdown mechanism is quite complicated, you may note some strange phenomena such as the one shown here for um, relatively small values of base current. Detailed study is beyond the scope here, but simply important to keep in mind when using a BJT that there's a rated maximum collector emitter voltage that the BGT can sustain while still behaving properly. Finally, note that the breakdown mechanisms we've been talking about so far are not destructive to the BGT so long as the resulting power consumption and heat dissipation don't cause the transistor to overheat and get permanently damaged for that reason. So you can imagine with a large collector emitter voltage applied, for example, and a large collector current, rapidly increasing collector current, you're gonna be dissipating a large amount of power in this BJT, because of course power is gonna be voltage times current. Um, but as long as that's kept within safe limits so the BJT is cooled, so the power is di dissipated without overheating, then the BJT can recover and resume normal operation afterwards. However, if you reverse bias the emitter base junction, um, which we haven't talked about yet, but clearly that's another PN junction that can be reverse biased. That typically results in a permanent reduction in the transistor's beta, uh, and that's not recoverable. So here's an example illustrating breakdown of the collector base junction. You'll notice that the emitter in this example is left open circuited, so the emitter current must certainly equal zero. 
So we're kind of in that bottom plot that we showed a couple of slides ago where the emitter current is zero. But there is a finite current flowing in the collector due to this constant current source of, in this case, 50 microamps. So this implies that the only place that current could be coming from is from the base. So there must be reverse current flowing through the collector base junction of this PNP transistor in this case. So if there's a significant reverse current flowing through that PN junction, the base emitter, or sorry, the base collector junction must be in breakdown. And we're given that the breakdown voltage is 70 volts. So we must have 70 volts here. So we're asked in this case to be finding the voltage VO and the base is at 10 volts. So VO must be at minus 60 volts. Another sort of second order effect in BJTs is the fact that the current gain of the transistor beta in active mode depends on both the bias collector current, IC, and on the temperature it's operating at. So you'll often see on BJT data sheets a plot something like this where on the y-axis we've plotted the current gain beta, which we've so far become accustomed to thinking of as a constant. And on the x-axis here, you've got the collector current, the bias collector current. And you may get a series of plots here, each corresponding to a different temperature. So for example, when biased with one milliamp collector current in active mode at a, on a very, very cold day of minus 55 degrees Celsius, the BJT will have a current gain beta of about 100, but that same transistor, if operated at a high temperature of 125 degrees Celsius, would have a much higher current gain of over 300. So in particular, this temperature dependence may be of uh, considerable importance because you'll notice that as temperature increases, beta current gain also increases. This can set in motion a positive feedback that gives rise to a phenomenon called thermal runaway that can be especially problematic when large voltages and currents are involved. Just imagine the situation where you've got a BJT biased with a constant current IB here. And let's say it's a cold day. You power the circuit up on a cold day. Collector voltage is connected to a large enough supply voltage here to keep it in active mode. Um, and so when you initially power up the circuit, let's say it's minus 55 degrees Celsius, you're operating at a beta of about 100, right? Let's say the resulting collector current's about um, a milliamp, so that would correspond to a base current of about 10 microamps, right? So on this cold day, right, initially the collector current is 100 times 10 microamps or a milliamp over here. So at power up, you're sitting around here. But with current flowing, you've got some energy dissipation in the BJT. There's a voltage drop here, a milliamp current flowing through it. That energy dissipation gives rise to heat. The heat increases the temperature of the BJT up to 25 degrees Celsius after a few seconds. Now, the temperature is increased and so is the beta up to 200. As a result, um, the constant current flowing, the into the base, the collector current's probably increased up to two milliamps. So you start out with one milliamp, now you go to two milliamps. Now there's more current flowing, more power dissipation, and more self-heating that arises. Eventually, it heats all the way up to 125 degrees Celsius. Now these temperature increases may seem extreme, but keep in mind that the physical device itself may be very, very small. So all this uh, power, although it likely isn't a lot of power, it's on the order of milliwatts, but it's, it's being dissipated in a very, very small volume. So unless you have a heat sink or something connected to the BJT, it can uh, very quickly increase in temperature. If it increases all the way up to 125 degrees C, now you've got a beta over 300. Now the collector current's over three milliamps and so on. You can see how it's a snowball effect and the temperature may just keep increasing 
and give rise to something called thermal runaway until the point where it overheats and um, is destroyed. So the key point that in order to prevent this that's required is that heat has to be taken away from the BJT junction itself and usually uh, connecting a heat sink to the transistor which has a large thermal mass can help slow down the heating uh, the self-heating of the transistor air running over the heat sink can draw the heat away from the transistor and keep this thermal runaway from happening eventually the temperature will settle to a constant value um, and uh, and this process is halted final point to make here is that this effect of thermal runaway is uh, unique to bjt's it doesn't arise in mosfets where generally as the temperature increases the um, drain current that flows decreases 